live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world. You are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Nahum Kligman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 49 of the From Entrepreneur, and I have a very exciting guest today. I am interviewing Tamir Goodman, known as the Jewish Jordan, but now known as a Jewish entrepreneur, Jewish From Entrepreneur, and so I'm super excited to have Tamir with me today. Tamir, thank you for joining the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for thinking of me. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. I, I know as a, uh, a lot of people in uh, our, our, our growing mishpacha, you know, we've been following your careers uh, since the beginning. And, you know, for me personally, it's super exciting to see you getting into the entrepreneurial world, uh, business manufacturing, patenting, uh, marketing, all this fun stuff. I, I think you do some uh, basketball camps as well. So I wanted to sort of uh, go through, hear your story here, specifically about Zone 190, uh, how that came about, and uh, I'm sure all my listeners want to hear the story. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks for thinking of me. Basically, I was a prof- former, I'm a former professional basketball player, and I, I blew my knee out. So you, you, when, so that, when, when, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was playing professionally, and I blew my knee out. The doctors told me that I was never going to play again, and um, when I went down to my locker... They had the team had already signed another player. He was already in my locker before I even had a chance to take my stuff out. Wow! And I I went up to the gym just to to see how it feels, and you know maybe I could prove them wrong, and maybe I can come back. But none of the coaches would rebound for me because I wasn't on contract anymore. And I just had that you know lonely moment in the gym, realizing that I'm never going to be able to play again. And I had a lot of basketball knowledge in my head, and I said I could either be really sad about this, or I could create something that will help the next generation of players. And I took that pain of not having anyone passing me the ball and I turned it into something positive because right before before Zone 190, any pitch back or passing device for basketball was one-dimensional. In other words, they would pass you the ball at one angle from the net out. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, in basketball, it's very rare that you ever catch the ball at that one angle face on. Usually you catch the ball from multiple angles, from the right, from the left, depending where you're standing on the court. So I decided that I was going to take that pain and knowledge and turn it into something positive and help the next generation of players become unscoutable. Basically in basketball, you, you want to force your pl- force players to weaknesses. But if I could create a, a pitch back where the ball comes back at every angle and the players could train at every angle, then they won't have weaknesses anymore. They'll be confident everywhere on the court. And that's how I came up with Zone 190. So instead of a traditional pitch back, which is one-dimensional, Zone 190 has a 190 degree frame. So you can now, a player can now catch the ball and score off of any angle that's within the 190 degree frame or even more. So it's like having, you know, 10 coaches passing you the ball from all these angles, even if you're in a gym all by yourself. So that's the basic concept. It's a multi angled pitch back for basketball. So I think that's great. And I think a lot of my listeners, they may not be so sure what uh, pitch back is, but I think you, you just explained it. If you had a, a, a live coach, he's throwing you the ball from all over the courts and you're supposed to grab the ball and, and try to make the basket. But if you're only – the pitch backs, as you're saying, is that, you know, when I was a kid, I was very into baseball. And so we used to you know, pitch the ball against the net and the ball will come right back at you. Right? So this, that was what was out there for you, but the ball doesn't always come back. You know, in a real game, in, in real real playing, it doesn't always come back to you. So you're saying you created this 190 degree like net that we can throw the ball any position, it'll bounce back to you at different angles, and that's how you improve your game. Correct? Exactly. Amazing, amazing. So you saw a pain in the market, and I mean that's just a that's actually a fantastic product. But let's take a step back. We're going to dig more into Zone 90 and into uh, the manufacturing process, the idea. I mean, we'll go into more detail. But first, a little bit of what I like to do is go back into um, you know history of, of the people I interview, where they grew up, what schools they went to, and, and I do that because a lot of people you know say, hey, no, I went to this school, I grew up in this city, or I'm not entrepreneurial, or whatever. It is. I want to say, hey, the people we interviewed went to the same yeshivas, grew up in the same cities, went through the same systems, and if they could be successful in seeing their dreams come true, so could you. So why don't you tell us about a little bit where you grew up, where you went to school, etc. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I went to high school at the Talmudical Academy in Baltimore, and uh, I played my college basketball at Towson University in Baltimore as well. So where did you go to grade school? 
Tom Medical Academy. Oh, okay. So um, that's a great school in, in high school? Yes. I went there for high, most of high school as well, Tom Medical Academy. I played college basketball on a full athletic scholarship without having to play on Shabbat um, at Towson University. And then after playing at Towson, I came to, to play professionally in Israel, where I played uh, most, of, most of my professional career in Israel for seven years before I blew my knee out. Oh, wow. So you played for a professional. Which uh, team did you play for here in Israel? I originally came to play for Maccabi Tel Aviv. My last team that I played for was Maccabi Haifa. Uh-huh. Wow. So, so the real deal. Now, when you were playing college, you said that they, you didn't, you, part of your agreement, I guess, with your full scholarship was that you wouldn't have to play ball on Shabbos. What was first? First of all, was there any pushback on that? And second of all, did they just not have games, scheduled games on Shabbos, or they had games you just didn't play? No, they they had games, but my coach, who wasn't Jewish, kind of my father, blessed memory, went over used to go went over the calendar with him, and he basically just said to the NCA and to our league and said, in the winter, Shabbos ends early; it doesn't end that late. So instead of playing at three o'clock or three thirty on a Saturday. Can you just move the game up two or three hours, and that way Tamir could play? So I really only missed one practice, which was on Friday night, Sokis, and I missed one game, which was a conference semifinal game, and that wasn't regular season. So because it was a tournament, my coach couldn't change the schedule, but everything else he managed to change. And my teammates were extremely supportive. I can't thank Hashem enough that I got to live out my dream um, without having to play on Shabbos. Wow, it's amazing. So, while you're in, in college, you're playing you're playing a uh, college level um, ball, and so then what happened? How did you 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 turn pro? I, I assume you had opportunities, or you could have taken a path of trying to go for an NBA team, but you decided to go to uh, Israel to play for a professional Israeli team. How how did that decision come about? Uh, I felt like I really wanted to be in Israel. I felt like it was the right place for me. I felt like my real goal was to prove to the world that you can play Division One on an athletic scholarship without playing on Shabbos. And that was very hard for me. It was very hard to always travel and a lot of times be the only Jewish person. And it was also very hard with kosher food and everything. So um, I, I longed to be in Israel. I wanted to be here. And when Coach David Blatt uh, gave me the opportunity, I was extremely excited and, and very thankful. And I, and I jumped on it. <laughs> So they, did they seek you out, or did you sort of uh, approach them, letting them know, hey, I'm open to playing in Israel? I don't remember the exact process, but it was probably a, a little bit of both. <laughs> uh-huh. So they came down. So, this, so now you finished your four years of college, right, correct? Did you get a I, degree? I, I, got my, I got my degree in communications, but I took a break. I didn't, I didn't finish it right away because I turned pro before I finished my degree. <laughs> uh, so turning pro meaning you went to play for, for Tel Aviv, Maccabee Tel Aviv. Exactly. So I, at first I, I turned pro and then I went back to school later to finish my degree. Okay, so that's awesome. Okay, so cool. So you went to – first of all, why did you go back at this point? I mean, okay, we'll get to that. So you went to play ball in for Maccabee Tel Aviv. How was that? Were you the only Orthodox player on the team? Yes, I think um, – I, if I'm not mistaken, I was probably the only – maybe, I don't know, I could be wrong, the first person to wear a kippah in, league, in the highest level of Israeli professional basketball as well. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, uh, but I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that I was. I definitely think I was while I was playing. While you were playing. That's yeah. amazing. And, and, and ha- that must have been, was it easier or harder playing uh, in university in America or playing uh, in Israel in terms of the reaction of, of, of your teammates? Uh, I think it was much harder in America. I mean, my, my teammates were always very sweet and very kind, but... I didn't really have any situations in Israel like I not at least not that often that like I had in America. For- yeah, in America, my teammates and the coaching staff were incredibly supportive, and I can never thank them enough for that. But there were times that were very challenging. For example, like Asara Betevet having to play and practice on a, on a fast day without eating or drinking, or like getting off a team bus on Friday afternoon and walking to the Jewish community because it was almost Shabbos, or traveling for over a week without even seeing another Jewish person, just playing basketball in universities. Whereas in Israel, it's like, yeah, you have non-Jewish players on your team, but the coaching staff and the management and the owners, they understand if you say, like, it's Purim tonight, can I go hear the Megillah that, and come to practice a little late? They'll, they'll understand that. Not like in America, they wouldn't have understood it, and would they, they would have, but it's just a little bit easier in Israel with like kosher food and, and some of the, some of the things. <laughs> sure, I guess they're more understanding. They know you're not just making up a holiday. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> it just uh, it was just a little little smoother, but but I could never thank my my teammates and and everyone back in America. That's for sure. I love those guys very much till today, and very thankful to them. So, so are you still in touch with your with your old teammates uh, from uh, from Maccabi? Yeah, from Maccabi. I'm in touch, I'm in touch with. With I think whenever you play on a team, it's a lifelong uh, relationship. You're, you're always going to be in touch with the players just because you go through so much together. You put in so much effort together that you're always going to, in most cases, always be, continue to be in touch with, with your former teammates. Interesting. So going back just a step, did you go to Israel for the year after high school? Or did, have you been to Israel before you decided to take this position? You know, um, I the... did not. I did not go to Israel for the year. Um, my my life was was all based around training, basketball training. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I I did visit Israel before that, and I always had a love for Israel uh, in my heart, and I was very excited to to turn pro and be able to play in Israel. It was more than a dream come true for me. What was your parents' reaction when you're saying, "Hey, I'm moving six thousand miles away"? Obviously, I'm sure they're supportive of your dream. I guess they were probably used to it since you were traveling so much in the states anyway. Yeah, my parents were just so perfect and so supportive in every single way throughout my career. There is no way that I would have ever been able to do this if it wasn't for my parents or my coaches. And I know that it wasn't easy and it was very hard, but it meant everything in the world to me that they always had my back, even if I was doing things that other kids in the community weren't doing. And that meant everything to me. So at what age did you actually really start taking your training for, for basketball seriously? You know, I, I guess we all, you know, I used to play bitty basketball back when I was eight. <laughs> you know, so at what right. point did you, did you say, hey, you know, this is something I'm taking seriously and, and you started putting in the time realized that, hey, your, your goal was to start, was to one day become a pro? Yeah, I, I mean, I played throughout my whole life, obviously a lot and basketball camps and everything. But I think when I was 14, um, I decided that I felt like Hashem gave me basketball and that I could do try to do something good with it. And it wasn't something that was just a hobby or something that I just loved. I felt like it was a little bit different in my case. And right. I think when I was 16, uh, it was the first time that I went to an invitational camp. I got invited to play against the players who are supposed to be the top players in the nation. Wow. And I was there for a week. And when that camp was over, my coach came to drive me back to Maryland. And as, as he was driving me home, I just said, I think that Hashem... You know, bless me just as much as everybody else in that camp. So, you know, why, why should I stop? I felt like I could compete with those guys. And by the time I was 16, I realized that it was going to be a reality. And by the time I was 17, I was ranked the 25th best player in the nation. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Now, what was some of the highlights of uh, being a pro player? Like, I know you were, you were interviewed in um, Sports Illustrated, correct? Yes, I've been interviewed in Sports Illustrated. I got to travel the world. I got to play against the best. Um, I got to see what it's like to compete against some incredibly talented players. But most of all, I think the greatest feeling was to be able to live out your dream, to not you know, let the world say what you can or cannot do, and to try to represent your people and to make Hashem proud, which was ultimately my goal to try to make a Kiddush Hashem through basketball. I, obviously, I'm not a tzaddik and perfect, but those were my intentions throughout. Amazing. And I uh, worked very hard on, on doing that. And I think it's summed up in this one story where we played uh, against Villanova, one of the top teams in the nation. The game was on ESPN, and I was starting, and I was very nervous before the game to play against such a great team. But as I walked into the arena, there was a little Jewish boy at the top of the stands with a hand, handmade sign that he wrote in Hebrew, Oh, wow. When I saw that sign, it kind of summed up uh, my career. I felt like that's, that was my goal. And uh, try try to do as much good as possible through basketball. Did you win that game? We did not win the game, but um, spiritually, <laughs> I felt like I won the game because that kid probably went home and and thought to himself, maybe one day I could play against Villanova with my keep on too. And and that was another part of it. That, or or that, even if it's not playing game, you, you realize that hey, any dream you have, you could wear your keep on and be a kid of Hashem. So I think that's exactly. fantastic. Exactly. How how'd you keep? I remember growing up, we weren't. There were times we weren't allowed to wear our kippahs. We either had to wear hats or we weren't allowed to wear anything because they said the kippah could fall off onto the court and you could uh, slip on it. So, what'd you do to keep it on? Uh, make sure it wouldn't fall off. Yeah, I would just use clips and tape. Now they have those built-in clips from my friend John that that makes them. 
a clipkeepers.com. But I think that by the time I was 18, no, no referee mentioned anything to me anymore about my keeper because they just, by that point in my career, they just knew that it was never going to come off. And um, I've, I've played in games where there were thousands of people chanting about it, <laughs> and I, I never took it off. And um, I think it's because my father, of blessed memory, was a lawyer, and he used to wear his keep on court. And I remember one time when I was a kid, I wasn't feeling well, and he couldn't take off of work, so he brought me uh, to court with him. And he told me to sit down in the courtroom, and I, 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 I sat on the back bench. And then like 10 minutes later, my father came in, and I, I saw him walk up towards where the judge was, and I saw his keep on, and I just said, no, I, my father's really cool. When I, <laughs> when I grow up, I want to do the same thing. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Okay, so now we we moved it. We moved to, to to Israel. We after seven seasons of playing pro, you blew out your knee. Was that during a game or that was during practice off season? I, I think it was a culmination of everything, um, and eventually my knee just gave out. I, you know, was it a I, shock I, to you? I mean, were, were, did you feel that it was going to happen sometime, or just? It was like a just like happened. Uh, it was hurting, 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 hurting. But I thought that it would go away, and then eventually I, I I couldn't walk anymore. It was just it was buckling. Like my knee wasn't able to hold me up anymore. So I remember during the MRI, the the person doing the MRI yelled out and he said that you have tremendous trauma in your knee, and um, that was even before the doctor looked at what what it saw what he saw in the MRI. So I knew that I was it was pretty bad, and I, I unfortunately wasn't able to continue playing. Like I said, I was motivated to take all the basketball knowledge that I had and help the next generation of players instead of just being crushed about not being able to play. So I, I first I met with an architect, and I tried to explain it to her what I was trying to build was only 90, and it didn't come out exactly right. So well, what year was this? Though, this was in about 2011. Okay. 2012, and so it didn't come out really. I couldn't maybe I couldn't explain it well. So although I'm not handy, I went to Home Depot. Uh, back in America, and I, I went to the plumbing section, and I, I tried to put it together by myself there in the alley of the plumbing section, and a, <laughs> a, a, a real plumber came over to me, and he tapped me on the shoulder, and he said to me, he said, son, that's not going to work. You're, you're going to mess up your whole bathroom. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. This is I'm trying to work on a sports apparatus. So I bought a bunch of materials. Um, my hands were literally bleeding because I didn't even know that you needed a plumber's wrench to tighten some of these things. I was using my <laughs> bare hands. Oh, my gosh. And I, I built a prototype by myself in the garage. I told my wife that I thought that I was on to something. And, um, oh, you, wait, wait. You got married. When did that yeah. happen? How that happened in the story? What, what point did that happen? Oh, I got married re- right pretty young, thank God. Uh, I got married uh, in 2000. I got to Israel in 2002. I think we got married in 2003. Yeah, we got married in '03. Oh wow! So you, met, so you decided to move. So when you became pro to Israel, you you were already married. No, no, you were already dating like your that. wife. No, no, we we only got we were engaged for two weeks. I, we met oh my Israel. gosh! <laughs> yeah, we met in Israel. She, my wife, is very similar to me. She gave her scholarship back to America, to the colleges in America, because she didn't want to compete on Shabbat either, and she moved to Israel. So when she told me she did the same thing, we just we knew that Hashem wanted us to be together. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. So she's American, but she also moved to Israel. Exactly. And we met here and we got married here. Thank God now we have four kids. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Yeah. Your kids play ball? Yeah, they play ball. <laughs> and, um, so it's, you know, enjoying every single day. Thank God. All right. So we're back in, so we're in Old Hope Depot. You, you, you make, you get all this material. You start building a prototype. First of all, did you do any research on what was out there before you decided to start building it? Yes, I did. I didn't see anything like it, preliminary research. So I built a, a basic prototype, um, and I met with a patent attorney, and um, he he filed the the provisional patent. And then I what I really needed was I needed a professional metal fabricator who could understand what I was trying to do and make, make it really good for me, because right now the prototype that I had was just something that I made by myself and very unprofessional. Right. And that was a very hard step for me because most of the fe- metal fabricating companies that I went to for over six to eight months just sent me home and said, you know, we, we build parts for trucks, we build parts for machinery, we don't do sports equipment. You know, this isn't what we do. Was this in America you were looking or you were you going yeah, overseas already? I was, no, no, in America. I was going all over America. And then uh, one day um, I sent my 
prototype video to a metal fabricator and while he's watching the video I said you know I'm sorry it's very unprofessional it's just you know what I built it's not my skill set <laughs> he said to me I really love your concept here and I really love your tzitzis because I was wearing my 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 tzitzis in my video where I show, was showing off my prototype so funny so that's, yeah that's how I know the guy's Jewish, <laughs> guy Jewish. And, and he was in the metal fabricating business so he, he said to me I'm not the right person but I, I know someone in Elyria, Ohio he's a master engineer he would he would be the right guy for you so because of my tzitzis till today that's who who makes it for me their name is Best Best Fabricator in Elyria, Ohio they make Zomo 90 for us amazing so, amazing so it's American made all American made, yes. Made in Ohio. Made in Ohio. So why did you, you – you felt metal – it had to be metal as opposed to plastic? Like what made you decide yeah, to go with that material? I felt – yeah, it had to be metal because you know I knew that – I was hoping that – I didn't know at that point that one day it was going to get to the NBA. Um, uh-huh. Now, thank God, it is. And those guys are very strong and very powerful. And I, I didn't – I wanted it to be able to withstand that type of speed, that type of strength, that type of power. I'm very glad that – that we have it like that. <laughs> Amazing. So, well, wow. so, you, so it's, we'll get to that in a second. Like, let's let's keep going along the story. So, you get the first after eight nine months of, of trying to find somebody, you finally find this guy in Ohio, and he says you meet with him, and he says what? He says um, he could do it. He feels like he could do it. He did it. Um, How long did it, it take? Took a, it took probably another six or seven months or oh, eight wow. months to get it right. Um, uh, we had uh, to find the, the perfect springs, the perfect netting, the perfect materials. It's a lot of a ton and ton and ton of trial and error, hours and hours of trial and error, and resilience and resilience. I remember when I finally got. I kept it a secret all along, but when I finally got the the prototype ready, I saved up for which coach I was going to show it to first that I was very close with. And after so many months of blood, sweat, and tears, I finally showed it to the co- first coach, and he, he shut me down. He thought, he said, it looks like a terrible idea. I don't no, know no. Yeah, that, that was the one coach who I thought was going to love it. So uh, that's why I say I'm glad that I was resilient because probably about a year after that coach told me that, it was featured in Sport- Zone 190, it was featured in Sports Illustrated, and it was chosen as a feature product at the Final Four convention in Tennessee. And they oh, let wow. me do reason. They let me do a presentation there in front of all the coaches on Sunday instead of Shabbos because they I told them that I wasn't able to do it on Shabbos. So amazing, uh, amazing. Yeah. So yeah. that I mean that's crazy. I mean, first of all, I mean you know all these entrepreneurs out there, you know you have these setbacks, you have these you know and, and the patience you need to have. You know I was in manufacturing also at one point and it just drove me crazy that how much time things take in between and just waiting for that first step. And I can imagine you take. This product that took you a year and a half to develop, find the right guy to build it, and then you and then this be shut down by the first person. So what? So what made you just keep going? You just believed in the product so much you were using it yourself. Like, or did you show it to friends? Like, what made you just keep going after uh, that? I, I just really believed that it's offering something to the players that's so valuable um, and it's so revolutionary, and I, I just I was so confident that. Players have tendencies in basketball. They feel more comfortable, you know, going one way than they do going another way, or catching the ball one way than they do going another way. So if you ever go to scout and listen to a scouting report, the the coach will say, uh, if this player is turning to their right, they're going to shoot. But if they're forced them to the left, they're going to take one dribble and pass because they're not as comfortable going that way. Uh-huh. So bas- also basketball is all about sending people to their weaknesses. But I thought it would be so valuable to a player to get rid of their weaknesses because on Zone 190, you're, you know, you could train every single angle, so you'll be confident everywhere. That's so valuable to a player and to a coach. And uh, I really, it was like it was more than just a product. It was like a mission. It was like a, I turned it into like holy, holy basketball work because again, I wanted to show the world that even if you're an observant Jew, you could create products for NBA players and also. Um, you know, I could no longer physically play, but spiritually, if players are using what I come up with, it, it allows me to stay in the game and, and continue to do what, what I love to do. And uh, that, that gave me a little extra power. Did you, ever, did you ever go back to that original coach who told you no after you had some success with the product? No, I never did. <laughs> <laughs> not, not my style, but I'm sure, I'm sure he, he's seen some of the sales that we've had. So what? So you talk about some of the, the players. Who are some of the players, the professional players that have used your product and have given you great feedback on it? 
players at all levels, really, and from the NBA to uh, NBA teams to top NCAA teams, literally the top teams in the nation, top high school programs in the nation. LeBron James AAU team has one. Uh, it's just you know, it's just very fun to get feedback from top coaches and top players. You know, uh, some of the best skill coaches in the world. You know, there's a guy, Coach Gannon Baker, that trains all these NBA guys. I you could see it on YouTube what he says about Zone 190. It's just uh, it's very it's eased the pain of me not being able to play basketball anymore and made me very happy. Thank God. So Omri Caspi, I, I saw. I think he, he's uh, he's a fan. Omri, yeah, he was actually the first NBA player to, to try it out, and he's been very supportive since day one. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, he's also a very good friend. Awesome. It's, uh, uh, been very, it's been a great, great, been a great journey. Beautiful. Okay, so how how do you sell the product? Like originally, you were selling it one by one, or you had it in stores, or you said you went to this this trade show or this conference in front of um, you know the uh, I guess uh, basketball mm-hmm. coaches or, or basketball industry, and you said uh, it was chosen one of the top products in um, Sports Illustrated. So how did you go? Like I guess at that point you realized, wow, I really got something here. How did you then take it to the next level? How how were you selling it? Yeah, that that day at the NCA convention, the Final Four convention, was our biggest breakthrough day. Obviously, because there were so many coaches there, and I got to do was chosen to do an on court performance there, where all the coaches could see me run the drills with it, and that was our our breakthrough day, because that was the day that we got many um, top colleges in the nation to buy Zone One Ninety, and um, so yeah, basically of all. I was our breakthrough day, and since then, almost all of our sales have been online or coach to coach. Just one coach telling another coach about it, and uh, yeah, we we have some distributors, sports distributors, um, and you know we probably continue doing that. And um, we're also now working on like a backyard model, which will be like more for people in their backyards. The one we have right now is more like a pro model for teams. Right. Some back we have some backyard sales. But we, we we're going to create one that's more conducive for like the kids in their backyards. That, so that's that's our next step. That's a great idea, and I guess uh, uh, summer camps will probably be interested in, in probably uh, this version as well. Yeah, we have a lot of summer camps um, using it. Actually, a lot of Jewish summer camps too. We even have special needs schools using it. Physical therapy it's good for physical therapy as well. Yeah, we're we're excited about moving forward. Thankful. Um, Amazing. And what about, most of your sales have been U.S., I assume, but do you sell outside of uh, the U.S.? Um, yeah, all of our sales have been U.S. so far. We're just now working on like the shipping details and tax information with international sales because we've been getting our first requests from international teams. So we're, we're working out all that paperwork right now, actually. Excellent, excellent. So t- tell me, uh, what's I see you do something with um, sports strings or tzitzit. What, what's, what's that all about? Oh, well, that's another product that I invented and patented. It's sports strings are they're the only compression fit CT in the world that are kosher, basically. In other words, when I was playing, I'd always have to buy new CT and they weren't durable. And what's compression? I'm sorry, just what's what's compression fit? Compression fit is like what everyone wears now. The top athletes underneath their jerseys, they wear something that like compresses your body, which is moisture wicking, odor wicking, UV protection. In other words, like when you sweat, it'll take the sweat off your body uh-huh. and compress it so that you can continue playing without feeling like drenched like you really would be in a regular t-shirt, standard uh, cotton t-shirt. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So the problem is you can't, according to halacha, like you're not allowed to use those materials Number one, for it's not considered a begot, and number two, the, you have to have a four-cornered garment, so so it's not going to work. You know, so we came up with this concept where we have an inner layer made of these high-performance materials that compresses your body, and that's all the athlete will feel, or soldier, or anyone. And then they have an outer layer that meets all the halakhic requirements, but it looks and feels just like the high-performance shirt which everyone is training with now. So we were able to get the patent in America and in Israel, and. Um, it's an un- unbelievable product, and um, I just feel like, again, you know, I, it says like, Vasulahem Titit, like I feel like Hashem was giving us a commandment to go out there and actually go make it for them. Hashem was saying, Vasulahem, go make it for them way, in a way that's conducive for them, in a way that could be comfortable for them, in a way that, you know, it, it just, it didn't, I, I don't know when I, I, I remember when I first came to Israel, my second practice, a non religious coach, he said to me, well, Why are you taking your tzitzit off before practice? Because I wore them onto the court, took them off, played, and then after I played, I put them back on, and I gave him the standard answer. I said, Because 
you're not allowed to ruin something that gets holy. That's right. holy, and I'm sweating so much, I'm ruining my tzitzit. But then I saw that all these companies now are coming up with moisture wicking, odor wicking, these high performance materials that are made for sweat. I said, well, maybe if I make these, no one will have to take their tzitzit off when they're playing sports anymore. And that was my power behind it. And, and I'm glad to say that that's actually happened. <laughs> that's br- that's brilliant. I love that. I love that story, and I love your entrepreneurial drive and. Uh, I guess once you get the taste of creating something and and manufacturing and stuff, you don't want to you want to keep taking your ideas and bringing them to life. And you know, call Kavod for that. I think it's fantastic. So, so where can people buy um, these sports strings? Sports strings, they could buy them at Judaica stores across America, or they could also buy them on my website, tummyergoodman dot com. Okay, awesome. That's really great. And you also do something with, with basketball camps, or like in, in Israel, what's that all about? Yeah, I have basketball camps. I've worked with over 15,000 players around the world. Um, my basketball camp in Israel this summer is the first two weeks of July at Hebrew University for boys ages 13 to 17. And then uh, I'll be running basketball clinics that looks like a Camp Nesher in the Poconos and Camp Shoshanim, uh, which is also in the Poconos. And I train athletes throughout the year in, in Jerusalem. And I also work for Al Paul Jerusalem, which is the top pro team, uh, which is the pro team in Jerusalem. What do you do for them? I do international development, uh, marketing, branding, bring a lot of groups to the games. We have a suite for soldiers that we raise the money for so IDF soldiers could come to the game and sit in a luxury suite. We also do the same Amazing. thing with the Club Dell Foundation for Victims of Terror. So just try to do a lot of good through basketball. It's all, everything is all one thing, trying to do good through basketball. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Wow. So you're keeping busy. Yeah, thank God. So in a way, do you feel like, I mean, it's never a blessing to, to be injured, but do you feel like, you know, you're getting, you know, more satisfaction of what you're doing off the court than you did when you were on? I'm always going to miss the game. You know, there's, uh, I miss playing. I, I, right. I admit that, but I think that like everything in its time and uh, I, if I would have quit basketball early, I would have been more upset, um, but I never quit. In other words, I played until the day that I could physically no longer play and I knew that Hashem wanted me to move on to the next stage which is really a continuation that's what my wife says you're, you're continuing what you did just in a new way and I, I agree with her uh, I, I definitely miss playing but I'm, I'm thankful very thankful that I could still be involved in the game that I love so much beautiful beautiful um, okay so that, that's, uh, first of all how's the knee now? my knee is never going to be okay but I try to do everything I can to keep it as good as possible I work out a lot and I keep it very flexible and I don't own a car purposely I ride my bike everywhere and that helps me Uh uh-huh excellent okay cool all right so we're up to the I mean it's a great great story very inspiring I love the entrepreneurial drive but were you ever um before we get to what we call our lightning round just a quick question I guess this is actually gonna be part of our lightning round our lightning rounds when we ask uh, just a bunch of um uh different questions try to see what more what we could learn from you um were you entrepreneurial um, I, I know you said you were focused on basketball from even from a very young age, but did you ever, did, were you entrepreneurial in terms of drive or, or thinking about it while you're playing the game also, or is, this, or is the entrepreneurial drive just something that came uh, totally after you blew out your knee? Totally after, for sure, with respect to Zone 190. Um, with the Tsitsis, like, I knew while I was playing that I wanted to do it because from that day on, once the coach asked me why I took them off, I never took them off again. I played my entire pro career with the Tsitsis. Oh wow! And and I said I'm going to make this easier when I'm done playing. But I, I just while I was playing, I didn't have the time. Sure. Um, but but no, I really thought that I was going to play for another ten ten years pro. I I, I didn't think that this this was going to happen. Wow. Like All right, excellent. Okay, let's get to, let's get to our lightning round. I'll ask you just a few questions and you can give a, a few uh, a few answers, uh, quick answers. Uh, what would you say is the best advice you have received? Uh, the best re- advice that I received uh, was two things. Number one was to, to never, never settle, never, never settle, never let society dictate what you can or cannot do. I grew up with that. I grew up with a coach that did never let me settle. You know, you have an inner potential that Hashem invests in us every single second, and that's what we should try to focus on and not, not tell the world, not listen to the world that tells us what we can or cannot do. And as far as entrepreneurship, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the quote is, and I'm pretty sure it comes from Lubavitch Rebbe, but it's like if. Uh, if you see something that needs to be fixed or that could be added, Hashem wants you to see that for a reason so that you could partner with Hashem and make the world better through that. So it's, you know, Amazing. for entrepreneurs, if you see something, it's not something you should ignore. It's something that Hashem made you see that so that you could 
to do something about it. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I love that. I love that. All right, if you could offer uh, one piece of advice to a firm entrepreneur who's just getting started in uh, in, in, in his business, or, or, or actually, man- in this case, like manufacturing a product, what would it be? Uh, find the right balance, because I, when you become an entrepreneur, it, it could it, it's way more than a regular job. It, 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 it's your it's life. And sometimes I've seen, unfortunately, people can't find the right balance. So, you know, don't don't let your entrepreneurship come at the expense of your family. You know, like folk. You know, if you if you can do things, do it. But if you could have help, uh, you know, know what you can and cannot do. Like certain things, you don't need other people to do. You can do for yourself. But if there's other things that other people could do for you, maybe let them do it because it's very easy to burn out. So I think you need to find the right balance. Reframe what you're doing. Don't just do it just for the money. Maybe put a mission behind it or something spiritual behind it because that will give you more power. But ultimately, it, all this thing, in my opinion, comes underneath finding the right balance. It's, it's not never worth at the expense of, of your family or, or your kids. I mean, I know it's very hard because when you're an entrepreneur, it's around the clock. But, you know, it's as, as much as possible. Try to have the faith that everything that, that you're supposed to get, you'll get at the right time without having to like steal away time from your kids or, or your spouse. Amazing. That's amazing advice. And yeah, sometimes uh, I remember one of my earlier uh, startups, uh, there was months I, I went working till 3 a.m. And uh, it was just insanity. And I, I look back now, I said it just wasn't worth it. You could have, you know, if someone wanted you to accomplish something, you could do it in normal business hours without, uh, you know, uh, you know, sacrificing, um, you know, your, your Yiddish kite or, or your family. So uh, amazing, amazing advice. All right, what is something that you believe in that others think is insane? Uh, two things. I say number one, some people think that like if you share advice or help people or cons- give people free consulting, that you're going to lose out in some way. I, I don't think it works like that. I think <laughs> I, I just don't. I think I mean I could be crazy, but I feel like you, you never lose by helping people. You never lose by giving advice. Or, or being there for anyone. I, I think the world might tell us that way. The people have come over to me and told me, why are you giving that person all those ideas? Like, you're, you know, and you're not even charging them. Like, it's, I just don't feel like it's like that. I, I try to help every single person that, that contacts me, even if, if other people think that, that it, it's crazy. And um, I also think that, like, we live in this world, physical world, but we also, like, you know, thank God as Jewish people, we live a little bit... <laughs> Uh, above this world and that I mean that miracles do happen and Hashem can make things happen that other people think are impossible and you know when I was a kid it, some people told me that I'm wasting my time with basketball and that all the college teams and everyone plays on Shabbos so what am I doing like I'm off the wrong I'm going the wrong way on one way street but you know the truth is that that we can really do amazing things in this world this is Hashem's garden and even if someone tells us it's impossible, if Hashem wants it to happen, it, it could really happen. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, I don't think you're insane. I, I agree 100%. Um, you know, we don't fear our competition since we, you know, what's determined to come for us is going to come to us no matter what. So you, I, I agree 1,000%. You never lose out when helping someone else out. So call a vote for that. When you hear the word success, successful, who do you think of first and why? Uh, I think of my Safta, my... my um my grandmother, who was a Holocaust survivor, and the reason I say that I think she's successful is because she never lets like what happened in the Holocaust bring her down. In other words, it's a constant struggle for her, and she has terrible memories, but she lives every single day full of happiness and giving and kindness, and to me, that's like the true champion of success because she has a struggle, she has the battle, but she doesn't let it dictate her reaction, and wow. um, I, I, I feel like you know that's what successful means. But I don't think that you know. There's a lot of players I've seen in my life that have made it really far in basketball, but I don't think they're successful because they didn't reach their their own inner potential. They, they kind of just coasted with what was given to them, and everyone complimented them and said you're such a great player. But I really felt like I've seen where they could have done more. So success isn't like the big titles or the big money. It's each and every person reaching their inner potential and trying to win their their inner struggles, um, and and um, I got to see that every day uh, from my I still do thank God from my from my grandmother. Amazing, that's beautiful. Wow, does she live here in Israel? 
Yeah, if she doesn't hurt to Leah, I'm probably going to go visit her tomorrow morning. <laughs> give her my best. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe she's a fan of my show. <laughs> yeah. She's, well, she will be still, now, I guess. She, yeah, I'll tell her. She's still trying to wrap her head around the internet and everything. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. All right, just one last question and uh, we'll let you go because this has really been such a fantastic episode. I, I, I'm feeling truly inspired and it was really great to hear your story and, and especially your entrepreneurial story, which is somewhat less known than uh, your basketball career. But let, if you got, if you had to get stuck in an elevator with just one person for five minutes in the past or present, who would that person be and why? Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's a hard one. Yeah, everybody, uh, everybody says that when I ask them. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I would say I'd love to spend every single second with my wife. So, A, I'd love to be with no, her. No, no, that's cheating. There, that's cheating. That's obvious. You can't, if, you can't use that. If, <laughs> uh, if, I mean, when I was a little boy, um, my father took me to get a dollar from the Baba Trebi, which I never forgot, just seeing his eyes and that moment with him. But it was just one second. So I kind of wish I could would have been able to spend five minutes with him. So if I had to choose one person... I would have liked to, to have a little bit more time with him. That would have been cool. <laughs> Amazing, the Baba Rebbe. That's awesome. Anyway, Tamir, this has been an absolutely fantastic episode. I'm going to put some uh, videos and some links to everything we talked about in the page, so uh, everybody should uh, visit the site and, and, and get to those links. I'm super excited to uh, you know follow your business career and see what you come up with next, and you're doing some incredibly inspiring stuff. Is there a book in your future? Because I see you do a lot yeah, of speaking. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we, we my wife and I wrote a, a book already, which has been published by Diversion Books. You could also get that on our website or on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com, and it's called uh, The Jewish Jordan's Triple Threat. It's physical, mental, and spiritual lessons from the game of basketball. Amazing, amazing, fantastic! Well, I, see, I thought I had a good idea, and uh, you already did it. <laughs> uh, thank you, no, but you have a great idea in this show. And I wish everybody a lot of success, and uh, you should be blessed for all the people that you, you help and inspire, and that's the chat to everybody. Amen. Tamir, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Hi. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nahum Kligman. We hope you learned something valuable and will share this with your friends. For show notes, archives of previous episodes, and more information to help you start and grow your business, please visit our website, www.fromentrepreneur.com. Listen, learn, be Masliach.